the year living hope? Amen. Amen. God is so good. Uh, we're in our second week talking about character. We're going to go a little bit deeper. Last week we talked just about our thoughts. We're going to get even deeper and talk about our hearts. And I'm not talking about our spiritual organ, but rather our spiritual, I mean, I'm not talking about our physical organ, the heart. It's on our spiritual heart uh, this morning. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 this morning. Flip there. One of the things that God led me to this passage this morning is uh, how hard it is to guard our spiritual heart. How, how easy it is to let things come into our spiritual heart and taint our, taint our lives. Not just our thoughts, but every action, decision, our outlook on life can be tainted when we don't guard our spiritual heart. It's so vital. I mean, it's really it's so so very important for us to guard it. And we guard a lot of other things in our lives, right? We do. There's things that we guard that we, we, we esteem with great value. But when it comes to our spiritual heart, for some reason, we let our guard down. And I, I'm just speaking. I mean, you know, I know that. Uh, I mean, I understand. It, I'll just step back. It was interesting talking to some of the Ugandan uh, leaders. Uh, one of them, Freedom, was telling me how. They, they're, how they view pastors in Uganda and how we view pastors here in America. We're just kind of explaining some of those differences. And there's, there's a lot of differences between that. And, uh, and as I thought about that, you know, even in America, even though we've talked about that the view of American pastors has changed a lot because we what? We've lost character, right? We've talked about that. We've lost character. But there's still an idea that for some reason we kind of want to put a, pa a pastor up on a high pedestal. Right? Yeah, maybe you agree with that. And some of y'all like, but we do as a society. We like to put a pastor way up here, and we sometimes can forget a pastor is what human. Yeah, it's human, right? And and, and I'm just going to tell you from a from a pastor's perspective, even guarding my heart is extremely hard at times. There's times in my life where I have realized that I let my guard down, and things have entered into my spiritual heart. And it's begun to affect the way I see things and the way I look at things and the decisions and actions I make. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, we're, going to, we're going to walk about, talk through the scripture, it's absolute truth, and talk about how vitally important it is for you and I to do that. And then we're going to put some application to it to this morning. Okay? So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. We're going to look at one verse this morning, and then we're going to go to Philippians. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. God's absolute truth says this. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. Now look at it again. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. Uh, now, remember, we understand the Bible is not speaking, I just said that, of a, of a physical organ in our body that pumps blood, but rather a spiritual uh, uh, organ in a way to speak of. It's, it's who we are at the very deepest level. It is at the center of who we are. Our heart is at the very center of who we are. The inner us, the heart, is a spiritual organ that drives our actions, our behaviors, our decisions. And yes, if we're to be men and women of godly character, it's important where our spiritual heart is. It's very important that we guard our hearts. Now, Proverbs 4.23, we just read, teaches us to keep our hearts, right? It said keep. The word keep means to guard, to watch over, okay? So right there, we're reading Proverbs. It's important for you and I to guard, to keep, to guard, to watch over our spiritual heart. <coughs> Why? Why is it so important for you and I to guard our hearts? I want to give us a few things to think about when it comes to our spiritual heart this morning. Now, none of us would argue that our, our physical heart is, is valuable, would we? Think, 
if, if you have a poor heart, if you have a heart condition, do you realize how valuable that heart is to your, to your well-being, to the very pumping of blood through your, your circulatory system? Oh, I said that right. It's important. But sometimes we forget about our spiritual heart. Do you know your spiritual heart is valuable? Would you agree that your spiritual heart is valuable? Amen. It's very valuable. Your spiritual heart is so valuable that it is actually priceless. You can't put a price on it. You can't put a price tag on your spiritual heart. And let me just say this. Uh, and I'm going to use this illustration. No one guards worthless trinkets, do they? He said, keep, watch over. We don't guard worthless things. I, I remember, maybe you're like me. I, I've had a few cars in my day. Maybe you only, you know, some of these young people may have not even had your first car. Maybe you your first car now. I, I remember one car that I had. I remember it was, it was a 19, and when I say it, you might think of it. Some of you might think that was a really good car. 1982 Nissan 280ZX. Which, when new, would have been a pretty cool car. I paid not very much money for it. Um, I had to bust the steering column out of it so that I could pull out the ignition starter and crank it with a screwdriver. I, I, most of the times, the windows didn't work. Um, anybody remember cars like this, right? Uh, if, 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 if it were to rain, I didn't care. If it, were to, if, if it was time to wash the car, you'd think I didn't wash it. I didn't care. Uh, I mean, I didn't care what happened. I mean, it, when, when the weather report said hell is coming, I'm like, okay, who cares? I mean, it's not going to put another dent in this thing that I already had. Uh, if rain's coming, your windows are down. It's already, the floor board's already rusted. It ain't going to hurt nothing. I ain't going out there. That car is fine, right? And, and so I didn't, I didn't worry too much about this car. I mean, it got me to point A to point B, and I thank the Lord for that. But uh, not always. <laughs> There were some times when the car broke down on the side of the road, and I remember uh, having to replace the actually the timing belt on it in, in the middle of the middle of the road. But it actually still cranked up. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's amazing. And so, but I didn't I didn't protect it. I didn't put a car cover over it. I didn't guard it. I didn't care. Like we, you know, I think I still had uh, liability insurance, but I sure didn't have what you call full coverage insurance because no one's replacing this car. But then one day I got a different car. And that car was a different story. That car got washed multiple times in the week. If it were to rain, whoo, it can't rain. I could bought it at car cover. Because I didn't want to, I pulled it into the garage, with a, put a car cover over it. Because not only could it not rain on this car, but dust could not hit this car. I just got this beautiful wax job on this car. I can't let dust scratch up the wax and, and the paint. This car is too nice, right? I had an alarm system on this car. You know what I'm talking about? I didn't have a lock system on 2A. I didn't even lock the doors on 2A. You can come get it if you want with a screwdriver. But this car, I had an alarm system on. I locked it in, I locked it in the garage. I had a car cover on it. I mean, this thing was special. Why? Because I put, I ascribed value to that car. I didn't ascribe value to the 280. Did I? There was no value to that car. And, but there was a lot of value to, to the other car, the newer car. It was probably a brand new. So it was like, I think it was my second no, I think it was my first actually completely brand new car. Anybody ever bought a spanking brand new car and remember the smell? Man, it stunk. But I knew it was nice because it was a new car smell, right? I don't know why anybody buys that spray. Like, you're trying to fool yourself. You've got a 20-year-old car, but you're going to buy a new car smell. It doesn't work, right? And, and so, anyway, so we, I ascribe value to that car. We protect things that are valuable to us, right? So we'll protect that car like I did, but I didn't protect the 280 because there was no value in that thing. I mean, it was just a nightmare. And value it. What else do we value? We think about, there's things in our homes. We, some of us have security systems or some of us try to fake out the robbers and just put the ADT sign on. Right? There's no real security system. You just got the blue sign in there. And you stole that from your neighbor's job. But some of us have <laughs> security systems on our homes. Why? Because there's things that we ascribe value to that are within the walls of that home. And so we guard those things. So let me just ask you a question. And let's, let's put our, our, our noodles together. If I or you were to take your garbage out and you're going to put it in a trash dumpster, are you going to then stand in front of that dumpster 
for the rest of the night and the next few days till the, till the garbage man comes and gets it. You're not going to guard that trash, right? Why? It's not. It's trash. It's not valuable. It's rubbish. It's trash. It's not valuable. You do not. We do not guard that which we do not ascribe value. No value to. So I ask myself when I walk through this, if I have things in my life that I will guard tooth and nail, why do I not guard my spiritual heart? Why do I fail in that area? See, the fact is our hearts are so valuable that they are constantly for, uh, under attack daily. Your spiritual heart is constantly under attack every single day. Do you believe that? You better believe it. We have to guard our spiritual heart because it is constantly under attack. We have to watch over our spiritual hearts because every single day someone and some things are out to get it. John 10.10, 10, we know it very well. The thief comes only to what? Steal. Kill. Destroy. You know what one of those things he wants to kill, steal, and destroy? Your heart. Your heart. He's after your heart. Your heart to the devil, he's the thief. Your heart to the devil is very, very valuable to him. He wants it. He wants it. He wants your spiritual heart. He wants to drag your spiritual heart to live with Him for all eternity in hell. That's what He wants. That's what He desires. But some of you in this room, and pray, I pray many of you in this room, and I really pray most of everybody in this room, has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And if you have, guess who owns your spiritual heart? Who? God, yeah. Jesus Christ, God, He owns your heart, right? Your heart belongs to Him. He's given you a new heart, He said. You had a heart of stone. He gave you a heart of... What? Well, He put a new heart of flesh in you. He put a new beating heart in you. Right? You had a dead, lifeless heart. You got a new heart. God owns your heart, right? He owns you. you all of who you are, He owns you, right? He, he bought and paid for you by a price. The price was His blood on the cross. Right? So, so we see that. But here, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean your spiritual heart is not off limits, right? The devil still wants to get at it. That's why you've got to keep your heart over it. That's why I have to give, keep your heart over it. You know, once Christ has my heart, it's, it's, it's not as if I, I need to say, okay, I'm fine. Let me just expose my spiritual heart to whatever comes my way because I'm His. No, I have to guard that. It's extremely valuable. So, so Satan wants to get to your spiritual heart. He can't ultimately take it away from God because what's in God's hand, no one can pull out of. But boy, he can take your spiritual heart and cause bitterness and wrath and dissension and jealousy and all these other malices into your heart. If you don't guard, listen, if we don't guard our hearts. He gets a foothold. See, the thief is the devil, and he comes to steal some things away from you. He wants to steal your spiritual heart because it's valuable. He wants to keep it from beating for the Lord. He desires to take that spiritual heart of ours right to hell. I said that, but if he can't do that, at least he can keep our spiritual hearts for beating for Jesus Christ. He can do that. Many of us, if we've been Christians long enough, we've seen times in our lives where he's, where he's got his little wedge just way in the When we were on fire, our hearts were beating for Christ and his gospel and his word. And he got in there, and then we found ourselves, every time we thought about things, we, were, we had a, a negative outlook, a, 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 like a dark cloud. We looked bitterness, jealous, whatever it was, but it was there. And he, just, he, he stole that joy from that heart of yours. We've been there. We are to keep our hearts, spiritual hearts, he says here in Proverbs, with all vigilance. Vigilance means you put that heart of ours in a fortress, building up strong walls around that spiritual heart to protect it against the constant onslaught. We know, listen, you know, we understand this. We know when an invading army is coming, if someone were to tell you right now and me, 
I don't know, let's just go with South Korea. And South Korea was fixed to the land in Munford in about a week. What would we do? We go get our guns, right? We got a lot of guns around Munford, don't we? Come on now, we know we got guns. Wouldn't we? We go get our guns. We start nailing up our, our windows, wouldn't we? We start building a fortress of protection around our family, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Man, I, you know what? I, I don't think, I, I just don't think a, 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 a war is going to start in the South. That'd be foolish. We're well armed in the South. If you're going to start a war, you better start up there in the north, uh, Northwest. <laughs> right? You don't start, you don't start here. Because we're well fortified. We, that's what we do, though. We'd get our guns together. We'd make sure we had it. We'd rush the ammunition. We'd probably rush the milk and, and bread house, too. We'd nail, up, we'd nail up the windows. We'd build a fortress and protect with, with, with tenacity that which we value. And that is the picture of what we've got to do for our spiritual heart. We've got to build a fortress. Build, build that fortress. Make it fortified. Make it strong. Pay attention. Don't let anything in, that is negative and of the devil, wicked and evil, penetrate those walls. You know what? You know why our spiritual heart stays so weak? It's because we don't build walls. We don't. In our context, I'm just sitting here laughing in the back of my mind here because I'm thinking Trump built a wall, but... You know, like this is a different context, still a different context. But we, we got to build a wall, right? Of protection around our spiritual heart. Wage war. We guard our stuff, but not our spiritual hearts, which is more valuable. Which is more valuable, our stuff or our spiritual heart? Our earthly possessions or our spiritual heart? Now, of course, let me tell you, there's not anybody in this room that can't give the correct answer to that one, right? Everybody in this room can, I can, you can, you don't need some big theological degree or seminary. You don't need a lot of time. You don't even have to have a whole lot of time in the Bible to get this one right, right? Which is more important? Stuff or spiritual heart? I think I can get that one. I can go to, to the, our children and they'll get that one, right? All day long. So if we know the answer, then why aren't we guarding them? If we know the answer, then what are we doing about it? See, because just knowing that answer doesn't change how we live. Does it? It doesn't change it. Now, some of you may be sitting in here thinking that this spiritual heart thing is really no big deal. I'm going to pray with all my heart that you reconsider that position. Because it's absolutely... Vital. Your spiritual heart. He says, why guard our hearts? Because from our spiritual hearts flow the springs of life. From this heart, your and mine, mine, our entire life flows out of it. Your spiritual heart affects your thoughts, your words, your actions, your decisions, all aspects of our lives. And guess what? It affects our character, doesn't it? It affects it. If we do not guard our hearts, we will never be people of character. There will always be moments of our lives where we lack character. Now, I used to live in a huge town, Alabama, Hera Town. And, and so, one of the things me and my buddy used to like to do, y'all know power lines, right? Y'all been around power lines. And you know how you got those, those big dirt roads around power lines so they can service those power lines? Well, those made for some great BMX trail. Now, does anybody remember what BMX means? Right, like, okay, let's call them dirt bikes. So, pedal bikes, all right? And so, it was a lot of fun to go take the bicycle and just head out. Man, we'd head out and we'd ride for miles in those power lines. Well, it was a different day back then because us parents, our parents back then just kicked us out of the house and said, eh, I don't want to see you until, until the summer time. Remember that? You know, now we guard them under lock and key. But it was different then, and so we rode our bikes. Well, we, at one time, we rode our bikes and we found this stream. We were so excited we found this stream. We thought, no one to our knowledge has ever fished this stream. We're going to catch some fish. And so we decided the next day that we're going to get our tackle box. We're going to get a fishing rod. We're going to ride our bikes. And, and we're going to go five miles down that mountain. I don't know if it was five miles, but it felt like forever on the bicycle. 
And we're going to ride all the way out to this stream. And there we're going to fish and we're going to catch fish like no one's ever seen before. Well, around five, six, seven miles away was a plant. And I remember passing the plant in, in my parents' car. And I remember seeing the pipe run out of the plant. And I remember seeing, seeing this little stuff coming out of the pipe. I didn't think nothing of it, right? I mean, I didn't know anything about it. They just put some waste down the pipe into this, this stream. But this stream was about connected to the stream that I was fishing. Some, I mean, like some six, seven miles away. And I remember as we started fishing, we started catching fish. And boy, how did we caught fish like some of you have never seen in your life? I had never seen fish like this. Some had an eye. Some had one fin. Some, I'm telling you, some had three eyes. Every fish we were pulling out of this stream was deformed. Of course, we were disappointed because we were going to have us a fish fry. And we were scared to death to have a fish fry. We thought, in our minds, we thought, I don't know if y'all remember the movie Swamp Thing, but we kind of thought that we better get out of here because the Swamp Thing's going to pop out of the blue. There's something crazy weird about this, this stream. But you know what was happening, right? Whatever this plant, this small pipe, was pumping contaminants into this stream. And this stream, this small bit of contaminants, had run its way all the way down six, seven miles down, down the stream and began contaminating everything there, too. See, that's what happens when we don't guard our hearts. You see, we let a little pipeline, we let a little pipeline for the devil get into our hearts. We don't guard that. We let a little pipeline. He puts a little contaminants. We say, we say things like this. Well, it's no big deal. That's just a little small thing. That's just a little drill. I can do this. I can watch that. I can let this into my life. I can let that into my life. It's okay. We start making compromises. We let that little pipe come in. And guess what? That little small trickle begins to affect much more than we ever dreamed it would. Amen. And then we look at ourselves and we wonder why we're having this problem way over here in our life, but we're only letting it drip in over here. Why in the world are we dealing with this way over here? By the way, because sin always takes you further than you ever wanted to go. Right. Always. So I'm just saying, and we... I'm, I want to be honest. We're not there yet. We need to be there. Amen. We need to get to the point where we see sin as a really horrible contaminant of our lives that it really is. That's right. And we need to not make excuses. We don't need to make compromises. We need to be honest. We say, that is a pipeline of corruption that I'm letting into my life. i got to shut it down because if I don't shut it down, it's going to affect a lot more. And it will. Sin always affects us more than we plan it to. How do we guard our spiritual hearts? And I'm going to run through this. If we're at 11, 16, I'm going to run through this. Uh, how do we guard? So there's some application here. I'm going to give you a way. Here, here's, one, here's, a, here's a great way to guard the spiritual heart of ours. Because I can tell you all I want that we should guard it, right? But I need to give you some tools, right? Uh, some ways to guard your heart. That would help. You think that would help? That would help. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Here's a great way for you and I to guard this spiritual heart that's so valuable to us and to the Lord. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. I'll read God's absolute truth for us today. With this, I'm going to chapter 4, verse 4 of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Now listen, we want, we want the peace of God, right? Don't we, who wants the peace of God? Amen. We want the peace of God. And we want the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Human understanding can't even comprehend the peace of God. And we want that in our lives. Listen to this, though. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your what? Hearts. Will guard your hearts and your minds, which is what we talked about last week, in Christ Jesus. You, want the, you need the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard your heart and your mind. 
Now, how do we do that? If the scripture lays it out, first thing, rejoice. Rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. And that's one of the things that it, it's been beautiful this week to be with the Monty Children's Choir because they are some of the most rejoiceful children I've ever been around, you know? Uh, I mean, <laughs> of course, in their culture, when, when they begin singing praise the Lord, they can't help but go. Like, they can't help it. Uh, they're going to move. And, and they just rejoice and they rejoice. Listen, when we rejoice in the Lord always, right? Is, is times good? Yep, rejoice. Are, are times difficult? Guess what? Rejoice. See, that's the problem. Times get hard. Times get difficult. We go through things and we stop rejoicing. And when we stop rejoicing, guess what we do? We let a, a, an area of our heart, we let that wall come crumbling down. We stop rejoicing. That, that wall comes down. We let that bitterness come in. We let whatever difficulty, that little darkness come in. And it starts to taint our lives, our spiritual heart. We let our guard down when we fail to rejoice in the Lord. What about let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone. Now this speaks of our character. To be, to be men and women whose character is defined by reasonableness. That is being fair, mild, gentle, patient, reasonable. Now how many Christians have you been across that you would say they're not very fair? They're not very mild temperament people. Anybody? Don't point to Stop pointing <laughs> They're not very gentle. Not gentle people. They're not patient. That's one thing I asked Freedom, who's over the choir. I said, I have noticed something about the, the Ugandan kids. They have something we don't have. It's called patience. I, I was sitting there, and I'm an adult. I'm 43. We're in Mountainville, and they had this chance to throw this. It's a, they call it a dart. It's like a six-foot, looks like an bow and arrow, you know, but they, they throw it with this. I don't really call it. They throw this little thing. And, and all, all of our money kids, 20 something kids, right, they're standing in line, and I'm over there like, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw. Will you stop talking about history so I can throw, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw. And I'm 43. And they're just like, I said, I've noticed you're so patient. We're not patient, right? We need to be patient. Uh, we need to treat people with patience. There are a lot of problems and miscommunications and arguments that happen because we're not. Giving patience. We need to be reasonable. The Lord is at hand. And this, this means that He is near. So what? So we don't have to be anxious about anything because He's near. Amen? He's near to us. He's near to His children. So, to, so that's another thing. Being anxious. When we are... To, is this, and do not be anxious about anything. We don't need to be anxious. We're anxious about stuff. We're, we're worried, aren't we? And when we worry about things, we let that wall come down a little bit. And we let things, we let all these things creep into our lives that, that we begin to worry. And we, when we worry and we when we become anxious, guess who we don't focus on anymore? We don't focus on God. We focus on our problems, not on our provider. To anxious, that's what it means to be troubled with the cares of this life. How do we keep from worrying about it, thinking about it, being focused on the anxieties of this world? He says here, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made, made known to God. So we do it by prayer and giving thanks. Going to God in prayer, telling Him about all of our needs. By the way, doesn't He already know? Him? He loves to hear from His children. Give your anxieties to the Lord and do this with thanksgiving. That's something we've got to learn. Right? When we go to God and we're going through some difficulties in our life and we we're anxious about something and we're feeling the temptation to worry about that anxiety that we're having, we should go to God with that, right? And when we go to God, we should be willing to thank Him even in the midst of that. We find that hard to do, don't we? When we're stressed, we're worried, we don't think immediately of giving God thanks and praise. But that's what we need to do to guard our hearts, to thank God. God, I know that even though I'm in the midst of this, this moment, that you are good, you are with me, and I praise you, and 
And I thank you that no matter what, you're going to stay with me and you're going to carry me through it. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be afraid. You're right here and I praise you and I thank you. We need to do that. Give it to God. Again, we're, he says here, we're, thank, thank God for everything, both those times that are great and those times that are difficult. No matter what is ha happening around us, no matter what we're going through, if you're a Christian's room, you have an eternity to be thankful for. And you need to listen to that again. No matter what you're going through right now, if you're saved, you're God's child. And you have an eternity to be thankful for. For if we will rejoice, Always, If we will allow our character to be fair, mild, gentle, patient, reasonable. If we will choose not to be anxious about anything, but instead pray to God. Make known to Him our needs and thank Him no matter what. Why? Because He's worthy of our things. Then the peace, it says, then the, then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Y'all please stand on the finish with Y'all been amazing. Thank you for that preaching and being reasonable about it. This is our heart. This is how we guard our spiritual hearts. I remember this moment in my life. I remember this moment when I felt and was flooded and was filled with this, the peace that surpasses all understanding. I, I felt it to a degree when I was saved, yes, but there was a moment of my life, and if I could pull my sleeve up, but I've got a monkey suit on today, and I can't, but there's a huge scar right here on my arm. I remember that as a, in my young 20s, that when, I, when I'd broken it, I remember the doctor coming into the doctor room, the doctor, into the, into the room, I remember being on the bed, I remember Jennifer by my side, I remember him telling me, what do you like to do with, what, with, with your life? What should be your hobbies? I said, I love to play basketball and I love to play tennis. He said, are you right or left handed? I said, I'm right handed. He said, I want to tell you, you're most likely not going to be able to do any of those things again. You see, you broke this little bone, little bone called the lepronox. And the chances of it ever healing back are just astronomical. I'm worrying so much. I'm going to be young, 20 year old, 20 something years old. I'm really young. And I'm so worried and I'm so anxious. And, and I'm there and I remember the moment well because then they, then they wheeled me away and they wheeled me away from Jennifer. And, and she was my lifeline of support at that moment. Like it wasn't God. I wish it was God at the moment. But I remember her being my lifeline. I remember her hand slipping out of my hand. And I remember y'all being so scared to death. I remember weeping. I remember them pulling me in and they were finishing up some of the, you know, uh, trying to, the an anesthesiology stuff, you know. And I remember sitting there on that and no one was around me. I couldn't hold Jennifer anymore. She was my lifeline, but she wasn't there. I couldn't do that. So then I had to reach out to the one who is always my lifeline, right? And that was God. And that's what I should have done in the beginning. And I didn't do it. And I reached out to God. And I remember on that, on that cold, you know, because it's hard. And I remember being there and I, I remember sitting there and saying, God, I know that you can take me through this earth. God, I know that you can you can fit, that this can be okay. But God, it's something like this. But God, whether I can use my arm or not, you're with me right now. You'll be with me in that operating room. And you'll be with me when I wake up. I'm okay with that. I'm telling you, as soon as I prayed that to God, the, the Holy Spirit just washed over my entire body. I felt a peace that I could not comprehend, that I cannot explain. But in that moment, I was completely fine. And you know what? Those anxieties and those worries were gone. They were gone. Whether I could use my arm or not didn't matter. God was with me. And I woke up and I was fine. And you know what? To, uh, another surgery later and a year later, I can play tennis. I can play. He didn't have to do that, but.
But he did that anyway because I'm just telling you, he did that. He didn't have to. I was good either way. Listen. You got to guard your heart, your spiritual heart. There's too many things, Christian, that we allow into that heart that hurt us, hurt our relationships. It hurts how we act. It hurts, it hurts how we think. It hurts how we react. It hurts our decisions in life. Guard your heart. Don't pray for us. Father, I love you so much. God, I just pray, Lord, that God, we understand how important it is that to go on our spiritual heart, God, that first and foremost, God, if there's anybody, anybody in this room, and God, their heart is not yours. Holy Spirit, you are the one who can convict them of their situation, their position with you, Christ. Are they saved? Do they know? Do they have a personal relationship with you, Jesus Christ? Holy Spirit, reveal that to them right now. Make it crystal clear to them. If they don't know you, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord, I pray they make it right. They would come down. They would confess of their sins. They'd ask for your forgiveness. And we know, God, how faithful you are and how loving you are and how graceful you will forgive them all their sins. Pray for everybody else in this room. Who like me, we've, we've, we've been on our knees. We've prayed to you. We are your child, God, and we praise you for Jesus Christ saving our souls. But God, when we listen to this word, your absolute truth, we realize there's areas, there's a pipeline of contamination that we've allowed into the walls that we were supposed to build up. Because of that, our spiritual heart is hurting right there's areas of our fault life that we must confess. There's areas of our actions we must confess. There's bitterness. There, there can be jealousy. Whatever it is, Holy Spirit, you reveal to us what that is. God, may we confess. May we be honest with you because you already know. May we confess and repent of that. And God, may you begin to help us rebuild the fortress again. May we all protect our hearts. We love you, Jesus. Have your way. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.